Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it's with gratitude to my past project participants that I share this presentation. For the past few years, I've been thinking through what folks might call the black radical tradition and trying to dislocate it from the presupposition that blackness with a capital B begins at the moment of transatlantic slavery and rather situated on the African continent, centering blackness in the global south more broadly. Instead of allowing our experiences as Africans to be a footnote in what I believe to be an incredibly useful, though somewhat incomplete, analytical framework. In placing the black radical tradition in conversation with spiritual rapture in my work, I've been asking how we might take seriously black cultural innovation and performativity on the African continent in context of enduring settler, colonial logics, and landlessness. This is a project that has taken many forms, with Vusi Yende filmed at the site where I did a durational performance in 2020. I met Uncle Vusi at a jazz listening session that has been running in Kwatema for over 20 years with a, jazz, with a group of jazz uncles, including renowned printmaker Sam and Shingetwa. Kwatema is a black township that, that was established in 1951, when black folk were forcibly removed from Painville. There are a few viral cell phone videos of Uncle Vusi dancing in taverns that generate a kind of feedback loop with this work. And the moment that may seem like an individual reaching for elsewhere alone is actually engaged in simultaneous ensembles and echoes for those with a knowing and participation. A reaching, a refusal of individuation, and a questioning of the distinction between the audience, the ensemble, and the performer. Recently, I've been returning to my first significant project and connecting the dots to what brought me here, the placing of spiritual rapture, this moment of ascension, in conversation with what I now know is a black radical tradition. And so I've been applying my current ways of working and thinking onto that initial material eight years later. And it's these reflections and fragments of a found footage archive I've been developing that I'm sharing with you today. In 2014, I embarked on my first significant period of fieldwork when I still believed critical anthropology was possible. <laughs> At its first instance, the project thought through the worship localities and spiritual mobilities in Johannesburg's inner city. My research was with South African and Zimbabwean congregants of local, syncretic, African-initiated, Pentecostal-type churches, namely Amazayoni and Amanazareta. The appropriate, that appropriate and reconstitute public space into sacred space through their communing for church services throughout the city, in parks, train stations, school classrooms, opposite firearm shops, against the walls of decommissioned synagogues, at the foothills of the mine dumps that bore the city of gold, and underneath the highway overpasses that echo the city's expansion. Informed by Michelle de Soto, I commuted to and through the city with congregants in the blues, greens, and whites of Zioni and Nazareta church uniforms, and then also walked these routes of worship on other days of the week. The project asked broadly what it might mean to walk through a modernist city constituted by the strategies and violence of apartheid spatial planning, the colonial imperative of racialized labor migration, and the enduring conditions of black landlessness consequent to settler logics. Whilst concerned with the matters of spiritual formation and how enraptured modes of walking may rupture the post-apartheid logics of city being, if only momentarily, the project centralized the types of irreducible hauntings and subversions that linger in and animate a city like Johannesburg and the land it rests on. Unearthed into gold mine dumps that simultaneously poison their citizenry with radioactive uranium dust and provides safe havens for both remarkable scenes of worship and harrowing scenes of gender-based violence alike, where just two months ago, eight women were gang-raped by alleged illegal miners at an abandoned mine dump on the east of the city. The land on which Johannesburg embeds itself necessitates that we not just walk the city, but also listen to the sonic palimpsest and lines of repetition and desire that it offers us. And more importantly, take seriously the emotional work this listening and sounding demands of us, 
where affect, joy, and conflict become far more useful and indeed productive ways of knowing and tending to not just the social gathering, but also the land. <laughs> Listening is ephemeral and unquantifiable. It predisposes a vulnerability in the listener, a posture of being agape that undoes the castle imperative from which borders have demarcated the Bantustan, the nation state and their hauntings. In engaging imperial space time as a stratagem of empire, listening takes the dust seriously and pays attention to how sonics undo impose conceptions of both time and knowing. I was not raised religious, but I grew up listening to the hymns of both Amazayoni and ZCC, sung by the various women who cared for me. I would go into their rooms and listen to them sing whilst they did the ironing. Their church uniforms would hang above the bed like an enshrined artwork of possibility, purposefully separated from the wardrobe which housed clothes drenched in labor and the mundane. It is precisely this reality of labor that informed the creation of the Um Nazareta and the Shembe church uniform, where their first prophet, Isaiah Shembe, a Zulu-born Pentecostal evangelist, attempted to create the symbol of Zulu hegemony in black migrant labor force of colonial South Africa that reduced black citizens to units of labor and their ethnic identity. Shembe congregants were trained to be exemplary Zulu workers, explicitly depicted in male worship attire. In addition to the traditional isinene and ibeshu, made from guinea tails and cattle hide, Shembe men customarily wear a collared shirt, tie, and sweater vest and carry a briefcase on their journeys to and from church, symbols of their both professionalism and their commitment to tradition. Labor and the ascension beyond it are co-implicated. The communal rapture is subversively complicit. It is informed both through and despite labor and landlessness. One day during my field work, I was speaking to one of my project participants, Samson. Samson strongly identifies as a Zulu migrant laborer from rural Kizuri Natal and belongs to the Church of Shembe or Ama Nazareta. During a con conversation and over the park outside the train station, the head bishop began the call, Ison Tweni. Ison Tweni means both church, means both at church and to church. The bishop makes this call like an Adan calling worshippers to remove their shoes and prepare for the service every Saturday. The bishop called again, Son Tweni. His voice reverberating through the brick park, Samson stopped midway through our conversation and said, we better go, the angels are coming now. You know, he's not just calling us to church, he's also calling the angels down from heaven to join us. His eyes were leaking joy. And they come, it's not just that we believe, no, they actually come, they are here with us.
After the final service each Sabbath, congregants hold a mukiri, a sonic and performative communion for the ancestral grounding of the collective. Different sonically to Mkidi held by Izangoma that centers the feverish, persistent polyrhythmic beatings of drums, or perhaps the gatherings of traditional dances in Johannesburg's mining labor hostels. Mkidi Woma Nazareta is similarly hypnotic, but it is distinctively slow and measured. Drums beat in unison, emphasizing the rhythmic and deliberate planting of congregants' bare feet on the ground as they move together. The impact on both the ground and the drum is something to hold onto amongst the repetitive, polyrhythmic, antiphonal, atonal blowing of imbomu, long metal horns which were originally introduced to the church in 1910 by their first prophet. I'm interested in these moments of communal ascension, the inability to individuate the performer from the ensemble, the audience from the ensemble, and lastly, the city, land, and dust from this thing we call spirit. Rapture, like mahunaj, is indeed freedom, and indeed freedom are verbs in the continuous tense, not nouns. Mkiri is a technology for going elsewhere and returning, for punctuating and remembering the networks of angels of worship, death, labor, loss, and life, of joy. It fills you up and empties you out. It breaks your heart and mends it at once. Black waveforms, a simultaneity of space and time, beats, rhythms, notational moods, and frequencies that encompass listening to and sounding black life emerge as sites of possibility for both the living and the living dead in the face of black labor unit status and the anti-black practices assigned to, as Catherine McKittrick writes, break black into absolute negation. Listening and sounding advocate for a continuous movement and circulation of the gift of spirit through the echo. What does it mean to center the internal workings of black sonics and our understandings of ourselves as black people, and also the land on which we and our living dead have been made wanderers? Thank you. <laughs> 